All right, looks like it's one o'clock. We still have some people coming in, but maybe we'll just sort of slowly start the introductions, um, make sure we have time at the end for plenty of questions. Um, so welcome everybody who's joining us. I'm sure a lot of you were at lunch with a researcher and I know that was uh, really fun and informative for us, so hopefully it was for you too. Um, now we are here to hear from Naomi Blinick, who is a master's student in the Conservation Sciences program, um, working in my lab, and she's going to talk to us about her project uh, looking at zebra mussel impacts on walleye populations and mercury concentrations. So um, thanks Naomi and take it away. Thank you so much Gretchen. Um, I just want to say thanks everybody for joining us today. I know it's a really beautiful afternoon outside my window here. So I appreciate you all taking some time uh, to learn about all the great projects going on at MACERC right now. So as Gretchen said, I'm Naomi Blinick. I'm currently pursuing my master's in the conservation sciences department um, and I'm in Gretchen's lab. Today I'll be talking about research related to zebra mussel impacts on walleye populations and mercury concentrations. And this is a collaborative project between the University of Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center, the Minnesota DNR, and the USGS, and were supported by a grant from the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. So today I'll be talking about phase two of this study, but I'm going to start with a few key results from phase one, uh, which sets up the work we're doing now. Phase one was a study conducted from 2017 to 2019 in Minnesota's largest walleye lakes, looking at the impacts of both invasive zebra mussels and spiny water flea on walleye and perch, uh, looking both at growth and using stable isotopes to look at differences in food webs. I'm going to talk more in depth about food webs in a little bit, um, but a notable result was that young of the year walleye or walleye in their first year of life were 14% smaller by the end of their first summer in lakes with zebra mussels. This uh, is represented by the plot on the right and the red dot um, right here showing the end of season length for uh, lakes invaded with zebra mussels as compared to uninvaded lakes, which we see here in black. Um, additionally, it was found that in these large lakes, young walleye generally maintained their reliance on their traditional food source of zooplankton, even as it became less abundant due to invasive species. Again, more detail on food web interactions in a little bit, um, but if you're interested in the results of phase one, I'd encourage you to check out the project page on the MACERC website, and there's a URL down in the corner. You'll be able to see this presentation after the showcase. So, it's been established that it's advantageous for fish to be larger going into their first winter because they're able to eat a wider variety of prey, they're less vulnerable to predation, and they have more energy reserves to survive that first winter. Um, another result from phase one showed that being smaller um, going into the first winter was associated with decreased survival in later life stages for walleye in the majority of the study lakes. So knowing this, uh, we're especially interested to see if these trends in growth and diet seen in phase one apply to smaller, more typical Minnesota lake systems. So for phase two, we have three research questions. Um, how do invasive zebra mussels alter lake food webs in typical Minnesota lakes? How is walleye recruitment affected by the presence of zebra mussels? And how do food web changes affect mercury pathways and concentrations in walleye and perch? And to address these, we're using three different approaches. First, we're using a carbon and nitrogen stable isotope study to look at food webs. Then we're doing an analysis of historical catch data from the Minnesota DNR to look at recruitment. And an analysis of mercury concentrations and isotopes to look at changes in mercury cycling. So I'm going to back up just a little bit to make sure we're all on the same page with some of the foundational concepts um, that the study is based in. So the most important one is that of a food web. Food webs show connections between producers and consumers. And we all probably know that in most ecosystems, there are plants that are eaten by animals, which are then eaten by other animals. Plants produce their own energy from the sun using photosynthesis, so they are called producers. As far as producers go in aquatic ecosystems, there are two kinds. Phytoplankton, which are microscopic algae that are floating in the open water, and that's what makes our, le our lakes typically green in color. And then aquatic plants and benthic macroalgae, which are attached to the bottom, <clears throat> excuse me, in the shallow nearshore environment. So you're going to want to remember phytoplankton, 
out in the open water and attached to the bottom plants and algae. Um, so animals have to eat other organisms to gain energy, so they're called consumers. But not all animals eat all plants or all other animals. So when we study ecology and how organisms interact, we're interested in who specifically eats who. As you can see in this basic food web of a lake, the diet of a walleye is quite different than the diet of a bluegill. While they're both consumers, adult walleye eat other fish while bluegill eat plankton and insects. So this means that these two fish will respond differently to changes in their environment, in part because they have different food sources. They can also be classified as having different trophic positions. You can think of that as the number of steps they are from the primary producers. Walleye are consumers of other fish and they're higher, they have a higher trophic position than a fish that eats insects or plankton. Now we're gonna think about what happens when we add zebra mussels to a lake food web. If you aren't yet familiar with zebra mussels, they're an invasive, aggressively colonizing mussel. They're around the size of a pistachio, and when they reach high densities, they may cover the majority of hard surfaces in a lake. They're filter feeders, and often the most noticeable impact of their presence is that they can cause dramatic changes to lake clarity by filter feeding on phytoplankton. So here's a good visual, I think some of you may have seen this, um, about one of the effects of all that water filtering, and that is how zebra mussels transfer nutrients from the open water environment, which we'll call the offshore zone, to the shallow nearshore environment, which we'll call the nearshore zone, just for simplicity in this presentation. So you'll want to remember this movement of nutrients from the offshore to the nearshore environment as an impact of zebra mussels. And just um, a disclaimer here, most of these concepts I'm talking about are much more complicated and nuanced than I'm making them out to be, but we're looking at broad scale patterns and I'm trying to make this approachable um, because some of these things get quite complex. So for clarity in this presentation, we're gonna be looking at the food web as it pertains to young of the year walleye. So those are walleye in their first year of life. For these little guys, their main prey item is zooplankton, which are very small animals or larval stages of other animals that occupy the water column out there with the phytoplankton. And as we saw in that food web graphic in the beginning, or sorry, zooplankton feed on phytoplankton, which are primary producers in the open water. Um, our young of the year walleye food web can be very, very simplified to start with phytoplankton, which are eaten by zooplankton, which are eaten by the young walleye. So when zebra mussels come in, they eat a bunch of that phytoplankton, meaning there's less food available for the zooplankton and in turn less zooplankton for walleye. If walleye are unable to adapt their feeding preferences, they'll simply have less food to eat and we know if they have less food, they will be smaller. They simply won't have enough calories to be as big as they used to before zebra mussels came in. And in this case, we'll have walleye that are smaller at the end of their first year, which will lead to lower recruitment. So if walleye are able to feed in the nearshore environment instead, we'll be able to detect that using carbon and nitrogen stable isotopes. They would be capitalizing on increased nutrient availability in the nearshore zone caused by the zebra mussels shunting all that energy to the nearshore zone and all those added nutrients will help them um, stay the size that we would typically expect. If they can get enough food um, in this zone or if they were feeding there more than we thought initially before zebra mussels, they won't end up being smaller and they'll have a higher resilience to reductions in zooplankton from zebra mussel impacts. However, this shift um, in food reliance from the offshore to the nearshore may increase their exposure to mercury and we're going to come back to that in a bit. I just wanted to share this photo of some young of the year walleye so that you know what we're working with here. Um, they, uh, this is taken midsummer in one of our study lakes. If you look closely, you can see they already have teeth, um, visible teeth at just a few months old, which I think is just a really cool thing to think about. So looking at how zebra mussels affect food webs, I'm using stable isotopes to investigate this. Using stable isotopes gives us some great insight that we wouldn't get from a traditional diet study, notably the isotope signatures reflect what the animals have eaten on a scale of weeks to months and can help us construct a food web, whereas just looking at stomach contents, you know, tells us what the fish ate in the last day or two. And is, of course, extremely hard with very small fish to do a diet, you know, stomach content analysis. So the different forms of carbon and nitrogen in animal tissues can tell us where they got their energy from way down on the 
in the food web. So carbon-13 tells us about primary producers, um, which primary producer this diet was most reliant on, and that signal is retained across trophic levels, and I'm going to tease this out here in a minute. Um, and nitrogen-15 tells us about their trophic position, and it accumulates in predators relative to their prey. So here I'm going to share a conceptual um, figure to help us visualize how this all plays out. Along the horizontal axis, we have our offshore and nearshore energy pathways. And then uh, along the vertical axis, we have, you know, our primary producer up to top predator. And so we're going to see how these look. And then after this, I'm going to share some pictures of what the data actually looks like when it's plotted in this way. So on our first level of primary producers, we have phytoplankton and benthic algae. And they have, like I said, different carbon-13 signatures that we'll be able to track up the, up the food web. So next we've got our zooplankton and benthic invertebrates. So that's like um, insecty type things that we find along the shoreline in the near shore zone. And then we get to fish. And to this point, like using the isotope signatures, we can actually see from the isotope signature whether a fish has relied majoritively on the near shore or the offshore pathway, which is really cool. And you'll see here that young of the year walleye, um, we've stuck in the middle for this example, and I'll explain that here in a sec. So walleye, as we see, they're the top predator in this conceptual system that we've come up with. They're, they're on the top on our vertical axis here. Walleye, both young and adult, they do have some flexibility in what they feed on, and we've seen that in some of the lakes, for the large lake data. While it's traditionally thought that young of the year walleye only feed on zooplankton, they've shown in the large lake data that um, they are more cosmopolitan in their diet and they can at times access the, the near shore energy pathway. And we're curious how in response to change, these walleye can move horizontally on this figure. That's what we're really curious about. So if we have this picture um, on the left showing our conceptual model, we sort of have two main options we're looking at. Either the walleye are going to keep eating offshore and we'll have, we'll see reduced recruitment. Um, so basically they're not taking advantage of the whole right side of that plot and they're only, they're going to stick with what they were doing, which is sticking with the offshore energy pathway, or maybe they can and will eat more inshore, in which case we don't expect to see changes in recruitment and we do expect that we might see changes in mercury concentrations and they would just be moving far over to the right on this plot. And I know that this is all quite complex. There's a lot of arrows, but um, our main points are if they keep eating offshore, that would make it hard for them to stay the same size. If they are able to adapt, they may be able to stay the same size, but there might be other impacts. So as I mentioned, phase one of this study was in Minnesota's largest walleye lakes and wasn't representative of the dynamics of more typical small and medium-sized lakes that we have spread across Minnesota. Those large lakes are also very unique in their physical characteristics and lots of other ways. So for the second phase, we wanted to get a more representative picture of the more typical Minnesota system. So we've expanded um, to add 14 additional lakes uh, and we're focusing only on lakes that do or do not have zebra mussels. Um, for this study, we have excluded spiny water fleas um, as a factor because they're kind of confounding with the zebra mussel impacts. So here's just a map of our study sites, um, our 14 lakes across the state. And you can see, let's see down here, we have Minneapolis, St. Paul. Up here, we have Duluth. So our study lakes do span um, quite a wide swath of the state. For the isotope study, we collected samples from across the food web, all the way from zooplankton and shoreline insects to adult fish using several methods. Uh, zooplankton toes, ponar grabs, which grab mud from the bottom, beach seining, gill netting, and electrofishing. Uh, and one of the advantages of this project is that we were able to collaborate with the Minnesota DNR and utilize fish captured in their gill netting surveys as well. So that uh, really helped increase our sampling capacity. Over the two summers of data collection, we've collected more than 3,300 samples from 320 sites, uh, more than 320 sites in our 14 lakes. And we're actually still processing our last samples here, so that number will grow a bit more before we're done. And here you can just see my awesome field crew and some of our DNR collaborators out in the field collecting data, um, putting in, in a lot of work to get all these samples. 
And once our samples are collected, that's not the end of them. Uh, they still have quite a bit of lab processing um, before they are ready to be sent for the final step, um, going through the mass spectrometer at the UC Davis Stable Isotope Lab in California. So my crew has been working really hard to process all these samples, especially with all the complications from COVID and some lab shutdowns. In addition, the Davis Isotope Lab has had pretty severe delays. Um, and so just last week, we received our first real big batch of data that included everything we had sent them in the past year. So there's obviously been quite a backup. And unfortunately, due to that, I don't have any concrete data analysis to share with you today on this project. Um, but I can show you um, some plots from phase one that exemplify what our data will look like when we get it back and go through the analysis. I think that these plots are such a great way to really uh, demonstrate that conceptual model that we just went through and how it looks when you plot real data. So I've circled the age zero walleye on here just so they're easier to see. Uh, on the left, we have Lake Winnebogashish, which does, ha does have zebra mussels. And we can see that young of the year walleye are um, further to the left on the plot, showing that they rely heavily on offshore resources. And we expect that given the declines we saw in zebra mussel lakes in phase one. So they're sticking with zooplankton and they aren't able to grow as large um, in those lakes with zebra mussels. In the middle lake, we have Mille Lacs, which has both zebra mussels and spiny water flea. And we see that age zero walleye have a more uh, mixed, um, mixed food sources here between offshore and nearshore. And then on the right, we have Leech Lake, which is uninvaded by either species. And interestingly, age zero walleye are over to the right. And this is um, really interesting because if uh, there are lakes where young walleye are already feeding more in the nearshore environment than we thought they were, those lakes might prove to be more resilient to reductions in zooplankton from mercury. So that's a really interesting, um, interesting piece of information that we got from phase one. And we're really interested to see looking at our lakes in phase two, if this is something that occurs in other uninvaded lakes as well. So to look at the issue of recruitment, um, Hanson Lab Master's student Holly Kundal is analyzing a 50 year data set from the Minnesota DNR looking at walleye catch rates to see if they're different in, um, if, see if there's differences in recruitment between zebra mussel lakes and uninvaded lakes. And here we just have an example of some catch per unit effort data from a fall electrofishing survey. And we can see that even before zebra mussels were detected in this lake around 2012, uh, the catch rates for young walleye was already really variable. Um, uncovering patterns in data this messy is a real challenge. And Holly's working with a very large data set that includes over 2,600 individual surveys from over 430 Minnesota lakes. It's quite a task. Um, if you missed her poster, if you missed her at the poster session yesterday, you can find her poster on the Showcase website to learn more about this aspect of the project. Our last question um, is about how these food web shifts might equate to greater exposure of walleye to methylmercury, which is a dangerous environmental toxin. Uh, we're looking at both mercury concentrations as well as mercury isotopes in walleye and perch from all of our study lakes. Mercury is a heavy metal. Uh, the mercury cycle is quite complex and I'm not gonna go into all the nuts and bolts of it, but the main thing to know is that mercury occurs naturally in the, in the environment. It's produced also by human processes and pollution. And the process of methylation is um, a bacterial process that happens in uh, the sediments of water bodies that then makes mercury available to animals. And so, you know, mercury comes into the system, not all of it automatically can be up, uptaken by animals, but the process of methylation is what enables that. Um, and then mercury, when it's consumed by animals, isn't exactly digested. We can't digest it and then excrete it. And so it accumulates in greater and greater quantities in predators through a process called biomagnification. So the tricky thing about mercury in that it can't be broken down and excreted means that it simply adds up in the tissues of animals. So as a fish eats more and more prey fish, it just accumulates more and more mercury. Uh, that's why predators have the highest amounts of methylmercury. And when humans consume a predator like a walleye or when, you know, uh, any, any other predatory fish, then we're also at risk of consuming large amounts of mercury. And in humans, uh, mercury exposure is 
dangerous and especially hazardous to women of reproductive age, pregnant women, and children. It affects brain development as well as the nervous, digestive, and immune systems along with other things. So it's really not something we want to mess around with. With all these extra nutrients um, in the nearshore zone due to zebra mussels, there's, an incre there's increased bacterial activity that leads to methylation. If it turns out that walleye are supplementing their diet with these enriched nearshore resources, then we expect to also see an increase in total mercury in walleye from zebra mussel lakes. This process was actually documented in a recent study in Lake Michigan. So again, we're interested in this mechanism in smaller lakes. And uh, here's one place where I do have just some very, very preliminary uh, data, very small numbers of results, but um, this isn't enough to make any real conclusions or run an analysis on, but I wanted to share it with you because it's kind of the only thing I have to report at this point. Um, and it's interesting in that it does align with our hypothesis so far. So again, like I said, the mercury cycle is really complex. I'm not really going to go into the detail of what any of this means other than we see a marked difference in our non-zebra mussel lake that was included in this um, sample test batch that we just ran. So the lake codes are along the sides of this plot, those two letter codes. So each color represents a different lake and our yellow points stick out quite obviously from the others. And so that's our one non-zebra mussel lake that was in this test batch. And what this points to is that there's a difference, a difference in how the mechanism of mercury uptake between our non-zebra mussel lakes and our zebra mussel lakes. Like I said, this is all really preliminary and we need a lot more data to see significant trends, but the initial results are consistent with what we expect. And like with all of our data, we're continuing to process the samples and work towards our analysis goals. And I look forward to having more results to share, um, hopefully at the next showcase. So to wrap up, I wanna go over the main points and what, what this all means on a bigger scale. The ability of preferred food for young walleye decreases with zebra mussel presence. We, we've seen that from the phase one results. And if walleye can't compensate for these food changes, we expect to see lower recruitment. And if walleye do compensate with increased, uh, increased reliance on the nearshore diet, we also then expect exposure to mercury will increase. So to me, this project really highlights how invasive species have cascading effects and how zebra mussels especially act as ecosystem engineers, changing the entire system that they're introduced to. Here we have a situation where walleye may either have reduced food webs, reduced food access and success, or they'll be able to adapt, but may be more highly contaminated with mercury. And I think we can all agree that both of these outcomes are undesirable from several perspectives. This research will help managers identify characteristics of walleye populations that are more resilient to zebra mussel invasions. Like I said, if they're feeding in the nearshore zone more than we thought they were, um, that's great to know. Uh, it, and it will inform proactive management and realistic goal setting for stocking programs, harvest limits, and it will help inform fish consumption advisories. However, I think it's really clear that the best thing we can do for walleye is to prevent the introduction of zebra mussels in the first place. And so I would encourage all of you to do your part and clean drain and dry your boats and equipment. Um, you all probably know by now that zebra mussels are impossible to control with any current methods. So prevention is really our best bet to keep them from impacting our native fish species that we care so much about. And with that, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone who assisted on this project. Like I said, it was a real collaborative effort and we could not have done it with all the hands-on help that we received from our DNR collaborators and um, my whole crew, field and lab crews that have helped so much. So thank you everyone. And now I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Naomi. That was really, really great, really informative. Um, we do have two questions right now off the bat. Um, one is, do you know or think zebra mussels are affected by mercury levels, growth rates, or length of life? So I think that's asking, are zebra mussels themselves affected by mercury? That's a great question. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I would expect that they wouldn't be highly affected. Gretchen, you can chime in here. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer. I mean, we think that the increased mercury associated with dry-stunted mussels comes more from the biogeochemical reactions happening kind of outside of zebra mussels themselves, more due to their like deposition of nutrients and increased sediments and um, 
and stuff in the near shore. So I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I agree. Like that's a that's a really interesting thought though, but it seems like the mercury concept is sort of an after effect of what zebra mussels do. And so they the zebra mussels are kind of done. Yeah. They deposit their nutrients and then it moves on from them in this building of mercury. Right. And they're not going to be taking up very much of it themselves. Um, the next question um, from the same person with zebra mussels, are we seeing any correlations with less benthic biomass? Um, I would say the opposite. We, I mean, we're not looking directly at biomass of say invertebrates and stuff, but um, across the board, zebra mussels and other dry scented mussels are associated with increased production in the, in the bottom or near shore zone. Um, next question from Bob Cran, Cran, sorry Bob, if I'm saying your name wrong. Going forward, is it more beneficial to stock fingerlings and they have passed the plankton feeding stage? Mm -hmm. Great question. Do you want me to answer that or do you want to answer it? <laughs> um, I think you have a bit more background on this one. Okay. Um, so that, I mean, that is a question that we are interested in answering um, with regards to, you know, first, what are the effects of zebra mussels on walleye you know, reproduction and recruitment. Um, what is the mechanism of that effect? And if we know that, then maybe we can um, provide some recommendations for management. So if, if really reductions in plankton are a bottleneck for walleye recruitment, um, bypassing that stage may be um, effect, an effective management strategy in lakes that we want to continue to support walleye. And that's one of the things we want to answer with the historical data analysis. So see what are the effects on walleye kind of survival through their first year of life and to parse that out between naturally reproducing and stocked um, populations. So do we see declines in natural reproduction? Do we see declines in the abundance of stocked fish? You know, how does that play out across different life stages of stocking? And what does that mean for a management response? Like ultimately that's the key question of what, is, what does that mean for the management response? Okay, uh, next question from Melissa. When you talk about near shore versus offshore, is near shore within a certain number of feet from shore or at a certain depth? Uh, it's not. There's not a hard and fast rule. We're generally looking, um, I'm using those terms as a general catch all in this presentation just for simplicity, but uh, for us, we're basically just looking at the littoral zone, so area where there's light penetration and high productivity um, along the shoreline area. And each lake that's different because each lake has different physical shape. And so some lakes have a really narrow, you know, littoral zone, inshore zone. Um, they drop off really quickly from shore, and that lake's going to have a really different amount of area that fits that category than a lake that has, you know, is really shallow in general and has a very shallow sloping beach. So where we collect our samples, where we collect invertebrate samples specifically for our like littoral baseline is generally within five feet, four to five feet of depth because that's where we're actually taking our samples from when we're doing shoreline um, invertebrate collection. And so I guess in terms of like where our samples actually come from, it's within weightable depth for humans. Um, so I suppose in that sense, you could think of it that way, but there's no hard and fast rule so far, the way that we've structured the study that says that, you know, after 10 feet from shore, it doesn't count. Yeah, that's a great answer. And I'll just add, so the like official technical definition of near shore or littoral zone depends on the shape of the lake and the water clarity. So the clearer a lake is, you know, the more area light can penetrate. Next from Dan, we have, you said Leech Lake is not infested. I believe it is infested with zebra mussels. That is correct, Dan. Um, when Naomi showed plots from phase one of our study and when it was sampled, it was not infested. So they found villagers in 2017, which was the year that we did the sampling for that phase one. Correct, so at the time, there wouldn't be an observable effect from zebra mussels, but you're, you're correct, it is now infested. Yeah, so we do have some interest in going back there since we do have a, um, a really good set of samples from kind of the pre-invasions or at least very, very, very early invasion year um, that we can kind of track how it might change over time. Yeah, and that's a really tricky thing with doing zebra mussel uh, sort of impact work is that 
at what point do we consider a lake infested? Um, that's such a tricky uh, determination to make. You know, if you find villagers versus finding one adult versus finding 10 million adults, those are all going to have different impacts on the system. And so Leech Lake is a really interesting example because we'll actually, we could go back and look through different stages of the initial infestation and see how that plays out in a way that we can't in a lot of systems. Our next question is from Reynold Mack, who asks, do we have any more information on survival of zebra mussels and calcium content in the lake? Hmm. There is information on that. Um, in terms of this project, is that asking, do you think like how it plays out in our study lakes or? I think maybe in general, Reynold, you can chime back in if we get that wrong. Um, yeah, so calcium availability is a limiting factor as far as I understand for zebra mussels. And so, uh, you know, chemical composition of lake water does play a big factor in how successful zebra mussels will be. Uh, I can't um, direct you to a, any specific thing at this moment, but uh, there is a, a guy named Steve McComas who I just love what he does. He does all these sort of feasibility studies in lakes for lake associations, looking at the chemical makeup of lake water and, and assessing the risk of lakes for zebra mussel invasion based on those factors. Um, and he's uh, very well informed on that issue. Yeah, and there's a couple start published studies that show a fairly strong threshold response of it has to be above a certain concentration in order for zebra mussels to survive. Um, it's one of the more clear kind of environmental drivers of invasive species establishment that we know of. So, uh, yeah. Oh, Reynolds Reynold chimes in again and says, in general, like 15 parts per million. Yeah, I don't have the studies in front of me, but that sounds about right. And I will say that in all of our lakes in our study that are classified in this phase two part that are classified as zebra mussel lakes, they, they all do have significant uh, populations of adult, reproducing adult zebra mussels. They haven't just been, you know, designated because they found some villagers it's quite clear that they are playing a major role in the system. Yeah. Okay, we have a question from Doug Jensen. Given that leech is now infested, do you expect that young of year will move offshore over time due to food loss and likely increased light penetration as zebra mussels invade those near shore areas? Hmm. So we actually expect generally the opposite response. Uh, we expect in systems where offshore uh, nutrients become reduced from zebra mussels filtering the phytoplankton out of the water column, we expect there to be reduced nutrients offshore and increased nutrients inshore. Um, and so in most lakes, that would mean, if possible, the young deer walleye are moving from offshore to inshore if they can to access those increased nutrients inshore. However, Leech Lake is interesting in that it already showed that young of the year walleye were eating a substantial amount of food inshore. So Leech will be really interesting if it can be revisited because that should show us if there's a population, you know, a lake where young of the year walleye are already accessing that near shore pathway more than we kind of traditionally thought they were. They should be theoretically more resilient to the loss in zooplankton production due, due to the reduced phytoplankton from all the filtering from the zebra mussels. So Leech is an interesting example and uh, I'm really curious if there's an opportunity to go back and see how it's playing out but yeah, it's, it's actually the opposite effect. So we expect um, reduced offshore productivity and increased nearshore productivity with zebra mussels. And I'll add to that, um, that you bring up the increased light penetration and increased clarity. That is an interesting and sort of confounding factor when we try to make predictions about what's gonna happen. So it, we, all else equal, we would say, well, if there's more, more food in the near shore, they would wanna eat there. Um, but if it's also getting clearer as it does with zebra mussels, um, and we know walleye are sensitive to light and they don't like really bright conditions, well, what does that mean for their capacity to go access those resources versus you know, being restricted to the deeper offshore zones where maybe there's not enough food? So that, that's part of the sort of mechanism and the question and the co complexity that we're trying to figure out of how it all fits together. Um, somebody has raised their hand. Um, Amy, if you could put your question in the Q&A or the chat. Um, Doug Jensen says, yes, it will be interesting example in Lake Erie while I moved offshore to deeper water as clarity increased. Yep. 
Um, and we see, I, I have other projects going on looking at that kind of optical habitat and what that means for walleye and the, the interplay of that physical habitat with um, food resources and what's available makes it, as I say, hard to predict what's going to happen and really interesting to see how this plays out. Yeah, and in some of our phase two lakes, I mean, some of these lakes have a max depth of 16 feet. So mm -hmm. this is a really different system when you're talking about one of the Great Lakes or Minnesota's large lakes. It's an entirely different ball game. Um, you know, if it clears up to the bottom of a 16 foot lake, where did the walleye go to get their desired habitat in low light conditions? Okay, so I see some of you are raising your hand. Um, so if you could just type your question in the, either the Q&A, so click on the Q&A or click on the, on the chat and type it there. I, I think that's what we're doing. I suppose I could allow them to talk. It looks like I have that option too. Oops. Okay, Amy says she accidentally hit the raise hand button. Great. Um, any other, oh, Doug says there may also be a difference between lakes due to staining. Mm, indeed, and light penetration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's something I'm really interested in. And so Red Lake, which was an, another large lake that was a part of phase one, um, where zebra mussels have since been found, um, staining isn't as much of a issue there. I, I guess there is some staining, but also just um, sediment resuspension. And so the majority of the sort of lack of water clarity in red is due to sediment resuspension. And so it'll be interesting to see how um, zebra mussels, if they're able to establish there, and if so, what, what happens over the long term to the clarity, if the clarity is not necessarily driven by algae, as it is in the kinds of lakes that we're talking about, but if it's something else like staining or, or sediment. And I think these questions are like such good examples of like I said earlier, like this is a highly, highly simplified, like large scale view of the complexities of this project. Like there are so many different factors that could play into uh, the results that we get that um, it's a it's a highly complex project, and it's uh, there's a lot of different a lot of different things that I couldn't go into um, even in a 25 minute talk, which is a long time. <laughs> okay, we have a question from James: How deep in a lake will zebra mussels go? Oh, great question. Uh, in my experience, from what I've seen, they'll basically go till the thermocline. Um, I worked on a MACERC project a couple of years ago looking at um, surveying for new, new infestations. And we did, so I was down on scuba um, looking for zebra mussels when, when they were still rare in lakes. And from, from there, that in terms of like being able to, to successfully establish, it seems that the thermocline is where it stops. Um, and they need to have hard surface. So if there's no hard surface, even that down deep, then they won't have anything to latch onto. Although we do see like in Mille Lacs, they were able to expand into areas with no hard surface over time because they created their own Whoa. hard surface. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> they weren't given enough of them. Um, well, it's like a rat king, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true, that's true, yeah. Okay, question from Jeff. Can any of this work be extrapolated to lakes with spinies but no zebras? Mm. Such a good question. Um, I, I'm not sure. I don't know that we can just apply it, you know, wholesale. Yeah. Sense, but I think it would be, well, that was kind of in phase one, right, Gretchen? Like you had spiny lakes, zebra mussel lakes, and lakes with both. And the hope was to get a clear picture of how they affect things separately and then together. And it was a little more confusing. I mean, yeah, was huge. Yeah, um, so we, I mean, we can know some things about how spinies impact food webs. So they, in some ways, can have a similar effect of zebra mussels in that they uh, reduce zooplankton abundance. They reduce native zooplankton abundance, um, which, can be problematic for a fish like walleye that eat zooplankton or you know yellow perch that eat zooplankton in their early life stages. But they don't have the effect of shunting those nutrients into the near shore. They're just more of a uh, like a stop, it all stops here sort of thing. They sort of cap the food web unless something can eat spinies, which some things can. Um, 
So I wouldn't say that we can extrapolate a lot, except for just understanding more about kind of the flexibility of feeding strategies of these fish. Um, and then, and one of the problems in, not problems, but outcomes of phase one was to see that um, lakes that have spinies are generally on average, like kind of different kinds of lakes than um, a lot of the rest of the lakes in the state. So they tend to be in more, deep, rocky, um, clear lakes. Of course, they're also in the lakes, so that's not always true. Um, but the lakes where we were looking, they, they had really different food webs than all the other lakes. And it's, and it's not entirely clear if it's because of the spinies or just because of the way those lakes are structured. And so that was sort of the motivation for this study to say, let's get a bigger sample size of zebra mussel only lakes that are kind of more similar in structure to better understand the effects of zebra mussels versus you know, lake morphology or water clarity or things like that. And a similar approach could be taken to spiny lakes um, to say, let's pick similar lakes that differ only in whether spinies are there or not. Um, we just don't have the person power right now to do both of those things at the same time. So we're doing zebra mussels now. And that's related to Phil's question, how does the added presence of spiny water flea in Lake Mille Lacs affect your studies with zebra mussels? Um, it is certainly a confounder that they're both there. Um, okay, Doug has a question or comment. Generally speaking, zebra mussels can colonize to 150 feet in depth. They need hard surface, which they can create as dead shells and accumulate in deeper waters. They're negatively phototactic. They don't like bright light. Thank you, Doug. Okay. We have cleared the question deck for now, so if anybody has some, we still have time. I don't see any more coming in. Um, so maybe we can start wrapping up. Um, yeah. yeah, I'll just say, you know, thanks to everybody so much for being here and for your interest in your questions. Feel free to follow up with either of us about this study, um, other questions you might have that we didn't answer. Um, Thanks to Naomi for a great presentation and to Maysirk and the Environmental and Natural Resources Trust Fund for supporting this work. Um, and I'm happy to kind of stay in here for a few minutes if, um, if anybody has any last minute questions they want to type in. But for now, we can, we can wrap up and say goodbye. Great. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. Doug says excellent work, thanks. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> All right, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in. People are slowly leaving. I don't know if we should just like sit here for a little bit or do the equivalent of like when people come up to talk to you in person afterwards. Good game, good game. Yeah. We got a question. Great. Is there anything in the lake that eats zebra mussels? Ah, we just asked this yesterday. Uh, apparently buffalo eat zebra mussels. Smallmouth buffalo. Um, and oh, there was another fish that Angelique mentioned, and of course it's totally slipping my mind. But generally they're not heavily preyed upon by native species. Lake whitefish will eat them in uh, the Great Lakes. We, we have whitefish in some inland lakes, but not a lot. 
Are there any other fish that you know of? I feel like pumpkin seeds will eat them once in a while, eat little ones, the little snail crushers that they are. Um, but I don't know of, yeah, and it's hard to know if they're targeting them or just picking them up when they are cruising along, eating stuff off the bottom. Yeah. Round goby, round goby will eat them in the Great Lakes, but those are invasive too. We don't have them in any in the lakes. Uh, Dan says, this is the hook that we need to influence anglers and other non-believers. No pun intended, I'm sure, Dan, with your hook <laughs> terminology. Um, oh, common carp. That's what it was. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, not enough to control them. Yeah, uh, Angelique yesterday, was, uh, it came up in one of the poster sessions, and she answered that common carp and buffalo are the two that she'd heard of most eating them. And I was like, oh, carp, great. Well, we certainly don't want to bring, <laughs> we don't want to bring those in to deal with the zebra mussels. But yeah, in terms of other fish, I, they certainly don't eat them in high enough numbers to control them yeah yeah i know with other you know kinds of invasives like in the in the bahamas they're trying to like train sharks and large groupers to eat lionfish as a management um, tactic but uh it's it, it would be amazing if someone could train a flock of bluegills to eat zebra mussels i suppose <laughs> doug says a common carp pulled from the that mississippi river had 200 zebra mussels in its gut great if they could eat two million more yeah. <laughs> right. Well, you can get a lot of carp out there. Yeah. Gosh, that's got to be uncomfortable. Right? Yeah, then we have a carp problem. Yeah, yeah. biocontrol with other invasives is usually not a good idea. Yeah. All right, I feel good about wrapping up. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Naomi, nice job. Thank you, thanks everybody.